UOP Multimedia presents The Ominous Continuity with Kevin Cole Creating insights on the history of Western civilization, international relations, education theory, technology, and current events This is episode one, Professor Carol Quigley in the article that said too little, reclaiming history from omission and partisan straw men. Hello, my name is Kevin Cole and welcome to episode one of The Ominous Continuity. A little bit of background before we get started. I'm a writer, artist, researcher, documentary filmmaker, and historian. I'm the creator of the website unityofthepolis.com, where I provide insights into the history of Western civilization, international relations, and education theory. I've been a proud co-producer of The Ultimate History Lesson, A Weekend with John Taylor Gatto, and a co-writer of the script for the documentary film State of Mind, The Psychology of Control. I'm also a longtime content contributor, writer, and researcher with my friends at tragedyandhope.com, and I've appeared on or my work has been featured in the Peace Revolution, 9-11 Synchronicity Podcast, History So It Doesn't Repeat, and The Deep End with Richard Grove, in addition to appearances on The School Sucks Project with Brett Vanat and other podcasts, radio shows, and publications over the years. At present, my primary areas of focus, aside from analysis of current events, include the Anglo-American establishment, the creation of transnational politics in the 19th and 20th centuries, the proliferation and the lineage of the concept of a new world order in international relations and geopolitics, the root causes and effects of globalization, the growing role of technology, cybernetics, and political correctness in society, the future of freedom and individual liberty juxtaposed to said movements, and last but not least, I'm laser-focused on the historical role of educational institutions and curricula in the management and governance of society and the expansion of the body politic, with special emphasis on the trivium of liberal arts education. In summation, I'm just a human being who chooses to do some of my thinking and learning in public for the benefit of others and posterity. I'm forever curious to learn, process, and try to make sense of this world we're living in, and I'm primarily interested in leaving a better map of the terrain for future generations. With that in mind, this is the ominous continuity. Special thanks to Richard Grove, Lisa Arbacheski, and John Taylor Gatto, Tony, Phil, Mark, Paul, Joe Plummer, Bill, Gary, Dan, Peter, Avi, Morgan, Jess, David, Michael, Earl, Brian, Joey, Brett, Nathaniel, Darren, William, Dakota, Janice, Trez, Tyler, Bjorn, James, Patrick, Kevin, Alex, Rodney, Michael, Nadal, and the members of the Tragedy and Hope online community, and anyone else I've left out. This podcast series has been a long time coming, and it's been your support and encouragement along the way that has made it happen. Also, thank you to Patrick Boberg for the bumper music. If you appreciate my research and analysis and would like to help fund my book and future projects of UOP Multimedia, you can support my work directly at unityofthepolis.com or at patreon.com slash Kevin Cole UOP. You can also do so by picking up a copy or subscription to my UOP Research Brain, which is a historical database and mind map containing over 11,000 entries which I've been compiling since 2009. If you have any questions, interview requests, topic suggestions, or anything at all, please feel free to contact me directly. Thanks for listening. Professor Carol Quigley in the article that said too little, Reclaiming History from Omission in Partisan Strawmen, by Kevin Cole. On March 23, 1975, an article appeared in the Washington Post Sunday magazine entitled The Professor Who Knew Too Much, and subtitled, Borrowing a Few Crucial Pages from His Book, The Ultra Right Made a Scholar an Unwilling Hero. The purpose of this article appears to have been to highlight the controversy surrounding the esteemed professor of history at Georgetown University, Carol Quigley following the release, suppression, and pirating of his magnum opus, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, published in 1966 and exhaustively researched and written in the 20 years between 1945 and 1965. Who was Carol Quigley? For anyone unfamiliar with the historical significance of this highly influential author and professor, 
He was brought to the forefront of public consciousness when former student, Rhodes Scholar, and President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton, publicly recognized him in a speech to the Democratic National Convention in 1992. As a teenager, I heard John Kennedy's summons to citizenship, and then as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley, who said that America was the greatest nation in history because our people had always believed in two things, that tomorrow can be better than today, and that every one of us has a personal moral responsibility to make it so. President William Jefferson Clinton. Professor Quigley obtained his A.B., M.A., and Ph.D. degrees from Harvard University and taught government and history at both Princeton and Harvard prior to moving on to Georgetown University. There he would become professor of history for the School of Foreign Services at the request of Father Edmund Walsh, who had founded the School of Foreign Services at Georgetown in 1919. Over the years, Quigley had become a consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense, Navy, Department of State, advisor to the Congressional Select Committee that created NASA, and advisor to the Smithsonian Institute. Quigley initially came to Georgetown to teach Development of Civilizations, which had been based on earlier versions of his first book, Evolution of Civilizations. While his impact on his students, the school, the faculty is well documented, it is for his many books that he is now better known. The final edition of Evolution of Civilizations was published in 1961, followed by Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time in 1966, The World Since 1939, A History in 1968, a stripped-down, excerpted version of the second half of Tragedy and Hope, and two books that were published posthumously, The Anglo-American Establishment from Rhodes to Cliveden and Weapons, Systems, and Political Stability, A History. Missed Opportunities and Omission in the Interview with Quigley in the aforementioned article, The Professor Who Knew Too Much, the discussion of Quigley's works and career were limited to a right-wing versus left-wing dichotomy, which does a great disservice to the historicity and veracity of the claims made in his most famous and revelatory works, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, and later, The Anglo-American Establishment, From Rhodes to Cliveden. Thanks to independent researchers, a 1974 audio recording was recovered from the archives at Georgetown University, which contains the actual interview that was conducted for this article. This is a very rare and candid interview with Professor Quigley and a lengthy discussion on the controversy surrounding tragedy and hope. The audio recording appears to have been in the public domain since at least 1998. The argument that the two parties should represent opposed ideals and policies, one perhaps of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea, acceptable only to doctrinaire and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extreme shifts in policy. Tragedy and Hope a History of the World in Our Time by Carol Quigley, page 1247. While we can be grateful that someone had the foresight to sit down and record Quigley before he would pass away several years later, I can't help but be disappointed with the missed opportunities to ask tough questions and actually report on them in the article that follows. We now know from listening to the audio tape that the article that followed the interview was selective in its scope and omitted many instances of Carol Quigley seemingly in fear for his career and or life if certain facts were disclosed. Throughout the interview, Quigley incessantly signaled for the interviewer to turn off the tape recorder and to be discreet, and at one point even stated, I don't know if you want to put this on tape. You have to protect my future as well as your own. Yet out of an article that Coyley claims that Quigley knew too much, it falls short of addressing Quigley's own statements on the tape or any of the crucial pages in question that the author claims were taken out of context by the ultra-right. Unfortunately, instead of focusing on the discussion with Quigley on what he actually did find in his historical investigations, which included original research into the power and influence monopolies of the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations, both organized by the trustees of the last will and testament of British arch-imperialist and De Beers Diamond Company founder, Cecil John Rhodes. The article avoids these facts and investigates individuals on the so-called right, who Quigley had claimed had misappropriated, misinterpreted, and plagiarized his works. In doing so, the writer of the article avoids any real investigation into the historical secret society that Quigley had claimed to thoroughly expose in his works, and if you know what to listen for, also at key junctures during this audio interview itself. The main targets of the article include Cleon Skousen, then a professor of religion at Brigham Young University who had been a former FBI agent and police chief of Salt Lake City, and author Gary Allen, who Quigley said, did know up from down. Skousen was the author of The Naked Capitalist, and Gary Allen wrote a book entitled None Dare Call It a Conspiracy. Quigley claimed that Allen had plagiarized whole portions of his book, Tragedy and Hope. When Quigley's publisher, Macmillan, told him they would not be defending his copyright, he decided he wasn't going to go after Skousen or Allen personally, which would have cost him a great expense. Quigley voiced his concern at the absurdity that a picture of him had been featured on the same page as J.P. Morgan, implying Quigley was at the heart of the plot that he was actually exposing. Quigley had vocally admitted his agreement with some of the organization's aims, but ultimately disagreed with its secrecy. Complaints of Distortions and Misappropriations Quigley's frustration, if you listen to the audio interview, seems to stem from the cartoonish way that his thoroughly researched history was being represented, that certain individuals were simply missing the point, 
in that his original and historical account of a secret society upon which he sought to shed light was being distorted for profit and political gains. None dare call it a conspiracy had claimed that tragedy and hope had unearthed the existence of a power-mad clique that wants to control the world, put in a generic fashion. Quigley's assertion was that this was not precisely the case, and that this portrayal was an oversimplification of the actual nuance contained in his research and books. He also voiced serious concern that people were trying to link every single secret society through history to the Anglo-American establishment he had spent much of his life researching, even having personal access to its historical archives over a period of several years. He made very clear that the group he was exposing was not the, quote, Bavarian Illuminati, and that those trying to make those connections between the Council on Foreign Relations and the 18th century Illuminati were guilty of believing that all secret societies are the same secret society, continuing that these people say they're all one. Quigley also discusses his concern that some individuals and groups were using his book to promote monolithic Jewish conspiracy theories, which he likewise found to be absurd. For anyone interested to know more about Carol Quigley's own complaints against Skousen and his book The Naked Capitalist, I would recommend reading the Roundtable Review dialogue between Quigley, Skousen, William Fort Jr., and Louis Midgley, published in the early 1970s, in which many of the alleged distortions, discrepancies, misappropriations, and plagiarized portions are discussed. Quigley details the role of the John Birch Society in the distribution and promotion of None Dare Call It a Conspiracy. The John Birch Society was founded by Robert W. Welch and included Fred C. Koch, founder of Koch Industries, who later resigned, and film and stage director Myron Fagan among its nearly 100,000 members. While following up on Quigley's accusations, I was able to confirm that both Skousen and Allen had been directly affiliated with the John Birch Society. It was not difficult to find some validity in Professor Quigley's complaints mentioned in the audio file, and I found that there were individuals including Myron Fagan who vocally perpetuated the myth of a direct historical continuity between the 18th century Bavarian Illuminati and the Council on Foreign Relations. Fagan had been a member of the John Birch Society while circulating some of these unsourced assertions, even releasing an LP entitled Illuminati, which featured the Council on Foreign Relations and the Crosshairs, and clearly insinuates a direct historical continuity among these groups. This does not follow that everyone associated with the JBS organization held this position, and it's beyond the scope of relevance for anyone who actually reads Professor Carol Quigley's works instead of relying on secondhand interpretations. I would also add that this does not negate the possibility of ideational continuity among some secret groups or societies, or the adopting of similar organizational frameworks for the benefit of secrecy, planning, and training of new recruits. While they certainly played a role in boosting the publicity of Tragedy and Hope, it remains that neither of these two books or the John Birch Society needs to be discussed if the goal is to objectively investigate the claims that Professor Quigley himself put into print. Whether or not others misappropriated his text, misinterpreted, or misconstrued any portion or all of Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, is irrelevant to the historical legacy of Carol Quigley and an honest assessment of his research and his works. The claims of insider knowledge into a very intricate secret society made by Quigley himself deserved to be examined in 1966 and 1975 at the time of the article's publication. Instead, these facts were obscured from the article and a convenient straw man was allowed to be built upon the idea that right-wingers and ultra-conservative writers had been solely responsible for the negative effects of publicity of Quigley's highly credible revelations to the general public. Skousen has simply taken extended passages from my book in violation of copyright and put them together in terms of his own assumptions and preconceptions to make a picture very different than my own. Skousen is apparently a political agitator. I am an historian. My book merely tried to give an account of what happened in the world in the early part of the 20th century. Carol Quigley, Quigley's Response. The Roundtable Groups and the Anglo-American Establishment. In the audio interview, Quigley makes it clear that the society he had been investigating centered around the Roundtable Group, which he denotes as publishing one of the world's best sources of international relations since 1910, known as the Commonwealth Journal of International Affairs. Quigley had noticed that prominent people in English life were affiliated with All Souls College, in a correlation between those who would later go on to become ambassador to the United States. I investigated that group, he states emphatically. This ambassadorship role would become an instrumental centerpiece of the founding of the Transatlantic Pilgrim Society in 1902, only months after the death of Cecil Rhodes. The Pilgrim Society was a British creation that spawned ongoing meetings in London and New York the following year with the purpose of fostering a special relationship amongst the English-speaking people, specifically catering to the wealthy titans of industry and intellectual elite in the areas of politics, press, education, philanthropy, banking, and business. It was out of these power structures that the Rhodes Scholarships and Rhodes Trust were introduced into the United States, with key Pilgrim Society members tasked with staffing Rhodes Scholarship boards and state committees. The Pilgrim Society had been shrouded in ceremony and mystery until its founder, Harry Bertain, was persuaded by Lord Lothian and other pilgrims to publish the story of the club, which he did in a 1942 book entitled Pilgrim Partners, Forty Years of Anglo-American Fellowship. But for King George III, war would have been unknown throughout the world today. The English-speaking race would have been reorganized as a unit, with its central parliament meeting alternately in New York and London, and it would have given peace to the world. Cecil Rhodes, 1901. 
Quigley continues that between the years 1899 and 1947, All Souls College had been so exclusive that it had only graduated 149 people, and while some of its students would remain as honorary fellows for seven years, others had maintained a fellowship with All Souls College for 55 years. He discovered that these individuals were able to keep their fellowships for such a long duration because of their membership and connections in the Milner Kindergarten, a group of initially young kids who had been chosen to run South Africa by Lord Alfred Milner in a who's who of future trustees of the Rhodes Trust and chairman of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Included in Quigley's disclosures are Lord Dougal Malcolm, director of the British South Africa Company Leo Amory, chief administrator for Lord Alfred Milner Lionel Curtis, and Lord Halifax. Lionel Curtis and Lord Halifax, Quigley discovered, had been roommates at All Souls College. Quigley discloses how it was Lionel Curtis who was responsible for the changing of the name of the British Empire to the Commonwealth of Nations. He states his amazement of how long it took Curtis 15 years to finish his degree, and that he had been a poor student who obtained, quote, the lowest half degree you could ever get, and nobody had ever heard of him. Furthermore, he was Lord Halifax's roommate at All Souls for years, he continues. And then I discovered that this fellow is behind everything that's going on. Lionel Curtis, you see? Professor Quigley then says in a measured tone, Now I don't think we should talk too much about this. Why is there no mention of this fellow who is behind everything that's going on? In the Washington Post article, Why shouldn't we talk too much about this? What kind of journalist doesn't follow up on such a statement? Professor Quigley changes the subject to how these individuals had been influenced as students by Alfred Zimmerman in his work The Greek Commonwealth, and how Zimmerman had become a source for tragedy and hope. Quigley met Zimmerman in 1947, who disclosed to him that he'd been a member of the secret roundtable group from 1913, recruited because of his involvement in the Educational Alliance Organization, an outpost of the settlement movement of the late 1800s, of which Lord Milner had been directly involved. Zimmerman claimed that he resigned in 1923 because the round table had been, quote, determined to build up Germany against France, and he began to disagree with that course of action. Quigley confides that he later met Lord Brand, another member of the round table group, and asked about Zimmerman's resignation, to which Brand replied that he had never seen it. It is at this point in the interview that Quigley says, Now I'd rather stop talking, you see, because this gets into all kinds of things. Quigley also shares that it was Zimmerman who brought Arnold Toynbee, the historian, into the secretive group. In the audio recording, Professor Quigley continues, quote, I knew the roundtable was very influential. I knew they were the real founders of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. I knew that all this stuff that's in print, that they were the real founders of the Institute of Pacific Relations. I knew they were the real godfathers of the Council on Foreign Relations here. I knew that, for example, you know the big study of history, many volumes of Arnold Toynbee? All right. I knew the manuscripts of that were stored in the Council on Foreign Relations during the war so it wouldn't be destroyed by German bombings, you see? I began to put all these things together, and I discovered that this group was working for the following things. They were a secretive group. They were looking to federate the English-speaking world. They were closely linked to international bankers, and they were working to establish a world, what I call a three-power world. The three-power world was the Atlantic bloc of England and the Commonwealth, the United States, Germany, Hitler's Germany, and Soviet Russia, a three-power world. They said Germany would be controlled because, and all of this is in my book, it's boxed in between the Atlantic Bloc and the Russians. The Russians will behave because they're boxed in between the Atlantic Bloc, the American Navy in Singapore, and the Germans. And this has all been described in my book. Notice it's a balance of power system. It's essentially what Kissinger, although he doesn't know what he's doing, he's bungling everything because he's such a prima donna, emotionally imbalanced person, he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Quigley then states, what's said in here, presumably pointing to the Skousen or Allen books earlier mentioned, is that these people were for world domination, and the group I'm talking about were not. Disclosing how Lord Milner got involved as the chief Rhodes trustee after returning from Africa until his death in 1925. It's an Atlantic block, he states, and continues by introducing Rhodes scholar Clarence Streit in his book Union Now, and that he represents what the group wanted at the time. Professor Quigley mentions that he even had Streit's daughter in his class at Georgetown as a visitor. He was built up by these people as the only solution, and his book Union Now had been anonymously called by Lionel Curtis, quote, the only way in the Roundtable Journal of Commonwealth Affairs, and anonymously in the Christian Science Monitor by Philip Kerr, Lord Lothian, later ambassador to the United States, as, quote, the solution to our problems. This is confirmed in Tragedy and Hope, wherein Quigley discloses that the Union Now project had been directly propagated on behalf of Lord Lothian in the Rhodes Trust. Quigley continues that of course this was Rhodes' idea. To and for the establishment, promotion, and development of a secret society, the true aim and object whereof shall be for the extension of British rule throughout the world, the perfecting of a system of immigration from the United Kingdom, and of colonization by British subjects of all lands where the means of livelihood are attainable by energy, labor, and enterprise, and especially by the occupation of British settlers of the entire continent of Africa, the Holy Land, the Valley of the Euphrates, the islands of Cyprus and Candia, the whole of South America, the islands of the Pacific not heretofore possessed by Great Britain, and the whole of the Malay archipelago, the seaboard of China and Japan, 
the ultimate recovery of the United States of America as an integral part of the British Empire, the inauguration of a system of colonial representation and the imperial parliament which may tend to weld together disjointed members of the empire, and finally, the foundation of so great a power as to render wars impossible and promote the best interest of humanity, the last will and testament of Cecil John Rhodes, 1877. Professor Quigley then outlines how the Council on Foreign Relations and the existing inquiry group were dominated by J.P. Morgan interest in the United States, and this has been how the roundtable had confidence that they could have success in taking over the influential think tank. The inquiry had been created by Colonel Edward House at the behest of President Woodrow Wilson, who himself had previously served as the chairman of the New Jersey Rhodes Scholarship Committee. The Council on Foreign Relations and Royal Institute of International Affairs, founded by Lionel Curtis and the Rhodes Trustees, were later solidified at meetings that took place at the Hotel Majestic before the Paris Peace Conferences of 1919. Quigley states that they had branches in all of the Commonwealth countries, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, and eventually India, and even somewhere else, Pakistan. Controversy surrounding the publishing of Quigley's magnum opus. With revelations like these, tragedy and hope, a history of the world in our time, almost didn't make it to a second edition. In 1966, Quigley had been seeking to fulfill his contract of two books to the Macmillan Company and his publisher, Peter Rittner. Quigley had already published The Evolution of Civilizations with a contract signed in 1961 and agreed to give Macmillan Company his next book, The World Since 1914. It is during this period of the audio interview that Quigley is preparing to talk about some of the controversy behind the publishing and lack of promotion of Tragedy and Hope that he says, quote, I don't know if you want to put this on tape. You have to protect my future as well as your own. Quigley states that Macmillan was purchased for $5 million in the summer of 1966 by Collier Book, which he confirms had been a J.P. Morgan company, and that Morgan Interest had bought up the free press. Quigley's publisher, Peter Rittner, contacted him and told him that there would be, quote, no advertising on any books that are published in the next six months. Rittner put up a fight, says Quigley, and he got one ad for Tragedy and Hope, which was a quarter page in the New York Times book review. By 1968, the book was out of print. Collier then brought back the last half of Tragedy and Hope as a paperback entitled The World Since 1939, A History, all the while continuing to tell everyone that Tragedy and Hope was out of print. The professor would soon find out that Tragedy and Hope had been pirated and a photo replication that was exactly the same, except for the gold trim included on the original, had become available on the black market and was being sold via a loose network of booksellers across the country. To Quigley's dismay, Macmillan, quote, didn't give a damn that it was pirated, and he stated that they had lied to me so many times. They lied and lied and lied and lied to me, and also to his publisher, Rittner, who had disclosed previously that he thought Tragedy and Hope was marvelous. Professor Quigley's contract also stipulated that in the event that his book should go out of print, he would have the right to recover the plates. He learned in March of 1974 that the plates to his works had been destroyed. This is in addition to finding out that the publisher had been turning away customer inquiries on the book. Contrary to what they told Quigley, Tragedy and Hope was a very popular and sought-after history text. You want to shut that off, says Quigley, referring to the tape recorder? While the Washington Post article was lacking in scrutiny and omitted many fascinating revelations and strange behavior by one of the 20th century's most prolific historians, it is fortunate that the public has gained access to this audio interview. It's possible that the interviewer may not have understood the significance of the moment and importance of the content that was being reluctantly divulged. Professor Quigley's detailed The Anglo-American Establishment from Rhodes to Cliveden wasn't published until four years after Quigley's death in 1981. This can excuse the interview omissions in The Professor Who Knew Too Much, but the Anglo-American establishment from Rhodes to Cliveden is certainly a more thorough expose on the inner workings of the Rhodes-Milner Roundtable Group, as outlined by Quigley, than an article in the Washington Post Sunday Magazine could achieve. At the time of this article's publication, the publisher of the Washington Post was Catherine Graham, also CEO of the Washington Post Company. Catherine Graham was, until her death in 2001, a prominent member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a membership she shared with her late father, Eugene Meyer, who had been the owner of the Washington Post Company, chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank from 1930 to 1933, and the first head of the World Bank in 1946. To illustrate this connection and conflict of interest, it was Philip Kerr, Lord Lothian, soon to be ambassador to the United States, and a long-standing member of the Rhodes Milner Secret Society Inner Circle and Society of the Elect, according to Quigley, that leaked to his good friend Eugene Meyer that Edward VIII of England was having an affair with an American woman named Wallace Simpson. This scoop given to the Washington Post by Lord Lothian led to the abdication crisis of 1936 and the installation of George VI as the King of the United Kingdom and the dominions of the British Commonwealth. The purpose of this chapter has been to start to reclaim some of the historicity of Carol Quigley's work from the grasp of omission and fallacious reasoning, and shine the light on the right-wing straw man that's been cleverly crafted over the years, which detracts from the esoteric and important historical revelations made public by one of the most influential professors of history in the 20th century. 
missing pages and multiple printings. There are many lingering questions surrounding the possible differences in the editions of Tragedy and Hope over the years. After undertaking a task of a page-by-page -page analysis of the most recent copy that was published by GSG and Associates next to a first edition, first printing, published by Macmillan in 1966, I found that the GSG and Associates copy appears as an exact photo replication from the original first printing from Macmillan. The only notable difference between the editions is the gold or yellow trim on the top portion of the book block, as discussed in the 1974 interview with Professor Quigley himself. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the Communist Act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as roundtable groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the Communist or any other groups and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because I've studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or most of its aims and have for much of my life been close to it in many of its instruments. I have objected, both in the past and recently, to a few of its policies, notably its belief that England was an Atlantic rather than a European power, and must be allied or even federated with the United States, and must remain isolated from Europe. But in general, my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown, and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, by Carol Quigley, page 950.